a familiar and select gallery, the 12 general election winners to varying degrees since the war. Look carefully to spot a rare species, just three Labour leaders in sight. If the polls are to be believed, that group could swell to four. As in 1945, 1964, 1997, this is a Labour moment. A party daring to dream, it's on a roll. Now, the way to illustrate this is, needless to say, on our swingometer. The swingometer rules. Glory days for Labour back in 1997, but the scale of its defeat in 2019 means that just to scrape into number 10 with a bare majority, Keir Starmer needs to add 124 seats to the 202 Labour won last time. Power to the people, or at least power closer to the people. That was Keir Starmer's pitch to voters as he took to stages in Leeds this morning and Edinburgh this afternoon. The Labour leader said the Scottish Parliament will get more powers if he's Prime Minister after the next election, including some over foreign affairs, while the House of Lords will be replaced by a so-called Assembly of the Nations and Regions of the UK. It's all part of a wider plan drawn up by former Prime Minister Gordon Brown to move power away from Westminster. But in his blueprint, entitled A New Britain, one is it one that will win back votes in Scotland? Well, we'll ask that question in just a moment. But first, our political editor, Glenn Campbell, has this report, which contains flashing images. Over to you, Gordon. A past Prime Minister with a plan for the future of the UK that includes giving Scotland a bigger say in how it's run. The issue now is no longer independence versus the status quo in Scotland, but change within the UK to benefit Scotland versus change by leaving the UK, which would do damage to Scotland. So what might change look like? The plan suggests replacing the Lords with an elected House that better represents the nations and regions of the UK, although exactly how and when this might happen has still to be agreed. Gordon Brown's also recommending that if Keir Starmer wins the next election, he should relocate 50,000 civil service jobs out of London, chair a new council of the UK to encourage cooperation with the devolved governments and improve Scottish representation at home and abroad with a voice in UK institutions like the Foreign Office and some international bodies like the Nordic Council. Putting job centres under Scottish Government control is another suggestion, although in 2019, Labour was actually proposing the full devolution of employment law. In Edinburgh this afternoon, the Labour leader gave a broad commitment to the Brown reforms. What well, Labour government to be coming in to carry out the change that is vitally necessary for our country. Shouldn't you have the courage in Scotland to test these ideas against independence in a Scottish referendum? We're being absolutely transparent and clear about this. Those are the recommendations. We will now turn those through consultation into a mission. We'll put those missions before the electorate. And if we're elected into power, uh, we will have a mandate then uh, to carry that out. Since the independence referendum, Labour's lost out in Scottish politics, with yes voters tending to back the SNP and no voters more likely to side with the Conservatives. With this new plan, Labour hopes it's found a popular alternative to both independence and keeping the UK as it is. Their rivals are dismissive. It's not going to change the position with regards to the EU or the fundamental economic malaise in the UK. So I think in that context, our offer of independence is the one that will cut it with the people of Scotland. Labour hopes voters will see its new power-sharing plans as a more attractive package of political and economic change. Labour has just one MP in Scotland. They had more than 40 when the independence referendum was held in 2014. We asked Glenn if he thought these proposals could help claw back some support here. Well, they're trying to change the conversation in Scotland and they hope that offering reform within the UK will appeal to many yes voters without putting off no voters who want to preserve Scotland's place in the union. 
and they hope that they will get more of a hearing in the next UK general election in Scotland, because right now Labour's ahead of the Conservatives in UK-wide polling, and there's likely to be a focus in that election on the battle for number 10, who will be the next Prime Minister, who will form the next UK government. They hope that that will give voters uh, an opportunity in Scotland to look afresh at Labour and to consider voting for them as an alternative route to political change, an alternative to both independence and sticking with the UK in its current form. Well, Sarah Boyack is Scottish Labour's Constitution spokesperson. She was on stage with Sir Keir Starmer and Gordon Brown in Edinburgh earlier. Good evening to you. Good evening. Isn't the reality here that there are lots of nice words in this document, but it's all pretty vague, isn't it? No, absolutely not. Uh, getting rid of the House of Lords and establishing a new assembly of nations and regions directly elected, that is big ticket stuff. At the moment, the House of Lords is huge and something like 80% of its members are from London alone. So that's a big ticket change. Well, people and might say they've heard this before, of course, from Labour, because you promised it previously and then failed to deliver. And we've been quite clear about the fact that we've committed to this and to come out this far in advance of an election is a real commitment. And the other issues about bringing Scotland to the heart of the government, cooperation, we have not seen that under the Tories. And a critical issue for me is entrenching devolution's powers. When we set up the parliament in 99, um, the Sewell Convention, for example, that UK governments would not normally override Scottish legislation and Scottish powers, that has been progressively ignored by the Tories. So entrenching devolution and removing that capacity to override our democratically elected parliament in Scotland absolutely critical. But again, people might think that this is fairly weak meal because at the end of the day you talk about enhanced status internationally for Holyrood, but the reality you give is the Erasmus scheme, a student exchange programme. Which we don't have in Scotland. We also have set it's one up. radical, But we though, haven't it? got it. Well, it's actually really important in terms of Scotland's global reach, in terms of opportunities for young people. It's a great example of a practical change. If you look at Gordon Brown's It's Brown's also a great paper, example of something that was lost when the people of Scotland, as the SNP would say, was taken out, were taken out of the EU against their will. And the other thing we would say is that if you leave the rest of the UK, it would be like Brexit times 10. Not comment from me, that's a comment from independent supporters. So this gives us the best best opportunity, a much stronger Scotland, but in a transformed UK. So the fact that there's transformation of powers for um, the north of England, uh, English regions, and support for our Welsh colleagues, this is game changing. It's learning the lessons of devolution, and it's going back to our key principles, transforming the UK. Is it really, is it really game changing for Scotland? So it looks like you're going oh, backwards, absolutely. because in 2019, you talked about unlimited borrowing powers. Now you're talking about something much less than that. In 2019, you talked about uh, devolving employment law. Now you're talking about running job centres in Scotland. Uh, we are also talking about uh, new opportunities for Scottish government to actually put in place a higher floor in terms of wages that people get, new opportunities. Um, the thing that runs through Gordon's paper is the huge economic inequality that runs throughout the UK. And the, so and the, and the Scottish government would say part of that could be addressed by having borrowing powers. Why not go all the way and allow full borrowing powers for Hollywood? Why are you backtracking on that? No, it's not backtracking. If you look at what the Gordon's paper says, it's about the capacity to use those powers, cooperation with the UK, and also we'd really highlight there are tax powers the Scottish Government has got, they don't use. But the, will there the borrowing are powers be limited? Let's government. talk specifically about the borrowing powers, because that is mentioned here. Will they be yes. limited? Because they were previously unlimited in the promise you made in 2019. There's both the opportunity to work with the UK government in the future, but there's, if it's a Labour government that is, but there's also new investment to come from banks. And that is critical because it's not just about but with borrowing, respect, I'm asking it's you about, about the getting borrowing new money. powers. Will they be unlimited? No, it's, it's absolutely clear in the paper. It's about working with the UK government. It's about cooperation. So the UK and government will set a limit on how much borrowing Hollywood can, can, can have? If I come back, it's powers we don't currently have that the Scottish Government would love to be able to use. So alongside being able to look at new taxes, these are key changes from where Scotland is now, and that's what a Labour government would deliver. So it's a real change on the agenda. But ultimately, when it comes to the borrowing powers, can you just explain what powers the Scottish Government would get under these reforms? Because they wouldn't be unlimited, would they? 
they wouldn't be unlimited, but we remember where we are now. So who would set we the are limit? Just, can, I just, can I just speak, Gary, without interrupting? We are coming from a Liz Truss budget, which has destroyed the UK economy, and it's left a massive impact on borrowing. So things have changed. There are new borrowing powers to be delivered in conjunction with the UK government, allied to new banking powers and banking support for investment. That is the game changer, and it's the commitment across the UK for new social and economic opportunities for people that would have to be delivered by a UK government. And not the kind of Tory government we've got, which is looking at austerity once again. Well, indeed, this and we're in a change. very difficult position, of course, uh, economically. We know that the health service is in crisis as well. Isn't the reality that an incoming Labour government would not see the kind of reform that we're talking about here as regards the House of Lords, etc., as a priority? No, I disagree. The fact that this paper was commissioned by Keir Starmer, that he's been on the front table both in Scotland and in Leeds today, shows his commitment to this. There's been a huge amount of thought put into Gordon Brown's paper. He's a former Prime Minister, former Chancellor. He understands how the centre works. When we set up devolution, we established a new Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Assembly. Both of those organisations are more powerful than they were in 99, but you've seen the Tories undermining that. So, so will, the, will, the, will the House of Lords be gone in the first term of a Labour government? That's the commitment that you would be looking at um, change to the House of Lords in the first term of, this, of the, U, the next UK Labour government. But some of the other changes would be able to happen much earlier. You know, the new, uh, the new opportunity to bring together the nations and regions, and crucially, the nations of the UK, to work on things like energy, uh, where we absolutely need joined up support across the governments. You know, we could be doing much more in terms of renewables, we could be doing more in terms of green okay. hydrogen, but we need investment and we need cooperation across the UK. That is absolutely not happening at the moment. Sarah Boyack from Scottish Labour. We're grateful for your time on the Nine tonight. Thank you. Thank you.